I am really in awe of our guest today, Kelsey. She writes with such a strong voice. I'm very excited to talk with Kate Manning about her new book, Gilded Mountain. Kate Manning is the author of the critically acclaimed novels My Notorious Life and White Girl. A former documentary television producer and winner of two Emmy Awards, Kate has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, among other publications. She was a co-founder in 2018 of The Proxy Project, a get-out-the-vote effort designed to increase youth voter turnout. Welcome to the first 50 pages, Kate. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here with you both. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored. I have to say I was hooked from the first paragraph of Gilded Mountain. It really does pull the reader in, and it sets the tone for the story. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your latest novel? Oh, sure. Okay, so Gilded Mountain, I don't know. If I had to do an elevator pitch or yeah. something, I might, I might say that. I think of it in a couple of ways. It's about a young woman in a small Colorado mountain town, a mining town that I named Moonstone. And in some ways, uh, I think of it as the education of Sylvie Pelletier. She's this young woman who um, lives in a uh, in this very extreme circumstance, and she's kind of she's determined to get a, a better life for herself. And um, so, in in a way, it's it's her education in these two years she spends in this little town. Um, but I also think of it as a kind of subverted Cinderella story because. Mm. It, it, she she gets herself opportunities with the local millionaires in the local uh, chateau, and uh, she so so in that sense, I could also describe it as maybe like Downton Abbey set in the Colorado mountains, and it examines a period of history, the nineteen early nineteen hundreds, when um, there was a lot of labor unrest and newspaper wars and and other things which make for very dramatic and exciting material for fiction. One of the things that's mentioned throughout the story are the tempting luxuries of the wealthy characters, um, mm. their leisure and ease, their parties and possessions. Um, mm -hmm. But you see that in very stark contrast to the people living in um, you know, the company town, the, the mining um, barracks, I guess, the, of Moonstone. And um, it, it really was interesting the way that you created those dynamics in the story. And there's a lot of parallels with things happening in present times, but I think we'll get to that in a minute. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I really, yeah. I do like how you refer to it kind of as the Downton Abbey of the American West. But I do think it goes deeper. I hope so. I do. Because I, as you said, I I think I'm drawn to, um, I don't know, maybe some of the, the tensions that we are currently or have been experiencing over the last two, you know, couple of years or decades. And, and when you look back at in time, you discover all kinds of history that you think, I can't believe I never knew this, particularly say about the American labor movement and and what workers, uh, miners in stone quarries, hard rock mines and coal mines fought for in the way they won um, rights and and better working conditions and better lives and built the middle American middle class. But you don't want to cram that all into a novel. Yeah. You, you want to, you It'd want be a lot to, to digest in one book. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I hope this book wears research very lightly because it's a story. Uh, it's a romance. It's a family story. It's about a young woman coming to, to find her own voice, I hope. And so I want that narrative to to pull you through the pages. And if you begin to understand what it was like in 1908 to live um, under 14 feet of snow in a very yeah. small cabin, <laughs> then, then, um, then you'll 
you'll I guess you'll get a good feel for for that for that time you know what it was like there yeah and I think it you know it you're right the storyline does pull you through because full confession I generally don't read on my phone but I read the advanced copy of your book on my phone I generally wouldn't do that but I was just compelled to keep reading and, and, and keep okay. going back to the story. I'm like, I need to know what happens next. So I'm wearing my cheaters and I'm, you know, reading yeah. on my phone screen. But um, it, it was a fantastic book, really. I really enjoyed it. And then the, as, I'm of so course, you know, we were prepping for the episode. I read that you have some personal inspiration for this book. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um you know, I'm a, my mother and my grandmother are both painters, they're artists. And so growing up, I was very, you know, sort of steeped in visual, you know, imageries, imagery and art. And so I'm very, I think images really inform my work and, and have done. So I had, I found this old photograph in my parents' attic years ago, and it was this cool kind of sepia tinted long panorama of a, a crowd of people standing in front of a mountain range. And I had no idea what it was. It said the, the little title was called National Retail Monument Dealers at Marble, Colorado, 1915. So I brought it down to, down to my dad and I said, why do we have this? What is this? Who are these people? He goes, I don't know. I think one of them is my grandfather. And I think he had something to do with quarrying the marble for the Lincoln Memorial. And I said, whoa, okay. Um, you know, I pictured a guy with a pickaxe actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just, so I, I hung the photo in my office cause I thought it was kind of, um, you know, sort of pleased to have a tie to that iconic monument. It stands for democratic ideals and unity. And so I, I, it's a, it's, it was hanging there for a long time. And finally, um, as my dad was getting older, I decided I would try to find out more. And lo and behold, this ancestor was not a guy with a pickaxe. He was a, he was the president of the company that did indeed supply the stone for that, that for the Lincoln Memorial. So um, I got very interested in the history of Marble, Colorado and Redstone, Colorado at that you know, in really kind of before my ancestors time there. And, and I, I found these stories that were just jaw dropping and these pictures of, of the mountains and the sheer difficulty of working in sub-zero temperatures and making subsistence wages and trying to get these giant, beautiful blocks of stone out of the mountains at 9,000 feet of altitude. And I found out a, a lot of other things which which have made their way into the story of Sylvie Peltier. <laughs> You've had some high praise for your book from other authors. And um, Christina Baker-Klein, um, she said in one of the blurbs for Gilded Mountain that the book is so immersive, so richly imagined, that reading it feels akin to time travel. And... Like, I, I really got that. Like, you, mm -hmm. it's richly detailed and um, such a strong sense of place in this book that we really do feel like we're experiencing Moonstone, Colorado, even though that's a fictitious place, but based in the reality of, of your research. Well, I, gosh, I don't know what that's a really high compliment, but especially coming from Christi Christina, so she's... Uh, she's really a, an amazing writer and an amazing literary citizen too. She um, she's written a, a number of books which have really captured uh, people's imaginations. And we can talk maybe later. I got to know her because we both wrote about the orphan trains heading west, um, and and that's how we uh, we came to know each other's work. But um, yeah, I think that. Sometimes so-called historical fiction gets ghettoized or, you know, put on a particular shelf with a particular stereotype in mind. And that might be that because sometimes writers get so enamored of the research and the fascination with how people did things in the past that they feel it 
it's necessary to explain every little thing like, okay, this is a, a garland stove that used by two minutes coal with <laughs> Isinglass windows. You, and I, I just am not that in, I want it to feel as organic as you and I, all of us talking about things that we take for granted. We shorthand things and we, you know, I'm, I just get fascinated with the vocabulary and the language, but I really don't like to get um, to, I want, would like it to be immersive as if you were the character experiencing these, these conditions and the freezing cold and the beans for dinner again. <laughs> yeah. So kind of keeping with our theme of historical inspiration, uh, can we talk about Mary Mother Jones for a minute? I yeah. honestly had no idea of her story until reading her book or your book, not her book. And then I decided, you know, I had to, of course, be a librarian and research and learn more about her. You know, she really just has such a fascinating story. And I guess my question is, did you always have a plan to incorporate this real life heroine into your story? Or did she kind of appear and take shape through your research or your writing? Oh, Kelsey, I'm so glad you asked me that. Because in fact, I was so enamored of Mother Jones and her story which is, you know, very inspiring. She was very fierce and theatrical and powerful labor leader um, for many years in American history. She was actually branded the most dangerous woman in America for her efforts to help workers. So I, I actually, um, you know, after my last novel, I was looking around in the past for other women whose stories might have been uh, kind of lost in the cracks or erased from our history books. And so I almost want, I, I sort of started writing about her and I thought, well, maybe she had a young assistant and mm. um, maybe it would be great to set this in a, a the Paint Creek cabin strike, or I was very fascinated um, by how Mother Jones led something called the March of the Mill Children. And, and we don't, focus on this so much, but she led about a hundred children in a march from Philadelphia to New York to go talk to Theodore Roosevelt, the president, ask him to end child labor. And some of these kids were six or eight years old and they were missing fingers from getting injured in the textile looms. And she, you know, brought this a uh, raffish crowd along the roads and found places for them to sleep and eat and attracted a bunch of attention to the cause. She was very powerful and effective. But um, I thought she was almost too much for a novel and there's already a lot written about her and almost not enough room to imagine. Yeah. And I needed to make things up. So over time the story evolved. And I think the characters in your book were really one of the strong points. Um, for me, I love things that are character driven. And the primary characters in your book are, are women. Um, but your characters are all kinds of women, different backgrounds, cultures and classes. Um, but they're all faced with living in a time that is hostile towards women, regardless of their station in life. And, you know, in, in so many ways, it really does echo to our current times. Um, and it made me think about that a lot in reading this book. Because um, I, yeah. I personally, mm -hmm. I, I love strong female characters in literature. And I think that they help us to find our voice and um, to give, you know, women permission to act out. Um, but I also think that our relationships with other women also give us that. Um, you know, we can lift each other up. We can be competitive or petty, you know. And so my, you know, the question, let me get to the question, right? <laughs> um, did you have to work for these relationships of these characters in your writing? Or do you feel like they develop naturally for you? Oh, I think they develop naturally. I, I have relationships and role models with women in my own life. And um, so they're exactly as you describe them, you know, how some women lift up and some women are competitive and some women are, are taught to stay quiet and be quote unquote feminine, um, which, 
you know, in, in our times, I think sometimes that conversation is fraught and weighted down. But if you look in the past, a couple things happened. It happened. It becomes um, a good kind of surrogate to discuss what's going on today because there's so many threads that you see coming from the past into our own times. Um, and, and in this, in, in both my last, my, both of these past two novels, um, women are, as you say, in, in a hostile climate, it's, they, they find the men that support them and the men who understand, um, what they're going through. And they, they use the skills that they have and the tools that they have to uh, defy authority and subvert expectations. And um, so in Gilded Mountain, there's a, a powerful newspaper editor, for example. She is based on a real character, a woman named Sylvia Smith in Marble, Colorado, who published a newspaper that was pro-labor, pro-women's suffrage in a time when women could not vote or could not own property. And in Colorado, she she was very critical of big business like the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. And when she criticized the marble company, she was uh, arrested, jailed, run out of town, um, her press destroyed. And that's to me, speaks a lot about how women's stories get erased. Yeah. It's not that women were shrinking violets and all giggly and, and you know, um, trying to get a man all the time the way you see in some historical accounts. Um, they, they, they were very strong, especially Western women in, in this era that you, the conditions in which they made homes and families are, are it's astonishingly uh, impressive. Yeah. yeah. And we have talked about, you know, Sylvie is the main mm-hmm. character and the world sees her as prim and proper. And she's been taught that silence is golden. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, growing up myself, I think we all have, you know, every woman has probably heard something, you know, f- from the world. Like I heard sugar and spice and everything nice you know that's what little girls are made of but um i love that you let us see sylvie's um anger and her rage with the world i think that's a just a fantastic element of her character but then also how she is resilient through loss and is able to endure hardships in her life um i think those were fantastic elements of her character Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, if you, I think if you want to find a woman's story, you really have to read between the lines and and pull back for a second and go, wait a minute, you know, was she really the most dangerous woman in America or the wickedest woman in New York? What was really going on? What if you were in her shoes? And, and is that, and, and then you find this extraordinary courage and how women try different ways of, of, of protecting themselves and and being comfortable in life so the other one of the other um you know the other elements is that it's true she has been she has been taught that you know complaints are the seeds of misery yeah (laughs) But then she sort of understands that, well, maybe misery is the seed of complaint. And if yeah. you complain a bit or if you spoke up. And so the novel is really a look at how she tries to find her own voice and have the courage to use it because she understands that sometimes the consequences for speaking up are very severe. Yeah. And, you know, women are told to bite, you bite your tongue and you know, say nothing because it's safer. Yeah. And so here in, in this book, she, she experiences, um, she sees ways that she might be able to do that, to speak up. In researching for this episode, I came across an online presentation um, that you did with the Westport Library um, with hmm. author and professor Rhea Hirschman. Um, oh, and yes. it was a couple years ago. Um, but 
I the presentation was so excellent and so eye opening, and I would highly recommend it to anyone listening today who is interested in the politicization of women's reproductive rights. Um, and then I learned that um, one of your previous novels, My Notorious Life, was based on a real person, um, and and because of this presentation, I really wanted to dive into this book. Um, and, and I'm enthralled with the character of Axie Muldoon, too. Like, I know we're talking about Gilded Mountain, but um, I really can't wait to get back to the story. Uh, and the New York Times called My Notorious Life an action-packed, thought-provoking page-turner. And I really <laughs> couldn't put it down last night. It, it's fantastic. So uh, I think Jen's thinking how she can move it up her to-do list today. It'll be like, how yeah. can I tie this <laughs> into my job duties today? I, I, it's Healthy. one of those books that I want to make time to read because I want to know where well, this... you have the best job for that. Um, it's, right. It's if a... only we had more yeah. time to read. <laughs> I know. I, but and... I really, I want to just take one second to say how much I I revere librarians. I spent most of my childhood at the public library bringing home enough as many books as I could pile up to my chin <laughs> and then take and go back and get more the next week. So but particularly now in these days of book bans and um, you know, really a misunderstanding of what, what libraries and librarians are for in a community in the way you build communities i just have to say thank you to to that for that so it's my little um moment of gratitude but the westport library and professor ria hirschman this I, maybe you don't know but she was my high school english teacher yeah they said and, that in the presentation and i was yeah. like wow yeah, so that's how it, cool is that it, really cool full really, circle moment really really cool thing and it was really, really fun for both of us. But we, we wanted to talk about um, the history of women's reproductive rights. And again, I, stumped, I really do think that a novel like this one can help you understand in a way that then a textbook can't help you do. Yeah. And I think a lot about what E.L. Doctorow said, which is that a historian will tell you what happened but a novelist will tell you how it felt. And so in My Notorious Life, it's based loosely, very loosely, on the story of a woman who practiced as a midwife in the mid-1800s in New York City. She also provided birth control and abortions. And this was in a time of, of uh, no anesthesia, uh, and when the remedies, so-called, for uh, birth control were uh, somewhat dangerous and somewhat unreliable. But her name was, the, the real character was Madame Restel. And she put ads in the paper for years advertising things like lunar tablets for the relief of female complaint, not to be used when asterisk, you know, the, the words were blacked out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so women understood that this, these medicines would cause a miscarriage, which in many ways is exactly like what we see now when women are relying on medication abortions to terminate pregnancies that are unwanted. And um, so in the 1840s, uh, actually, this the, the novel started with um, I'm, what I mentioned before, the orphan trains. Yeah. There were 3,000 homeless children living on the streets of New York. And do-gooders, religious uh, uh, Samaritans, thought it would be great to send the kids out west to Iowa and Idaho and Wyoming and Illinois to, you know, to find fresh air and, and good families because um, they were malingering and lingering on the streets of New York. Maybe they'd grow up to slit your throat or pick your pocket. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. So off they went. And so this this character, Axie Muldoon, starts as one of these street urchins. And again, it was an image that uh, of, a, of a child, a street child, that sparked that, that novel too. And when I got her out west on the orphan train, I thought, oh, gosh, I don't really know anything about I, I thought I was writing a novel about New York. So uh, in the 1840s. So when I 
stumbled upon a photograph of somebody called the wickedest woman in New York, I went, Oh gosh, who's that? Yeah. And, uh, and she, she took over the book in a certain way. Um, her history did. And I became uh, a new student of what our foremothers went through in the days before um, birth control and, and choice was an option for women. And when I wrote it in 2013, I had, I just didn't, I could tell that the winds were changing, but I didn't think we would be where we are today with states outlawing abortion and um, coming for birth control next. So I, I think it's not a political screed by any chain. It's it, I want it to be a rip roaring Dickensian tale of a scrappy person, um, you know, falling in love and searching for a family. And, and I think it is that, but if you, if you want to understand what it was like, as Dr. O said, back then to be a woman, I think it gives you a good flavor. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So you are co-founder of The Proxy Project, a powerful get out the vote strategy that pairs high school activists who are too young to cast a ballot with millennials or previously sporadic voters who will promise to be their proxies. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Oh, yeah, that was an uh, we founded that in 2018. I was working with a friend of mine who uh, Susan Addis Stone, who founded uh, the Women on Twenties um, uh, motivation to get a, a woman on a twenty dollar bill, and she uh, and and another uh, woman were so successful that they got the Treasury Department to put Harriet Tubman on the twenty, and I think that's still in the works and it's still happening, but. We were talking after the 20 election, 2016 election about um, the, the young people from Parkland and um, other places that, were, that had experienced mass shootings and how they were activist and engaged and pushing for political change. And they were really, um, really pe kind of penetrating, and, but they couldn't vote. They were too young to vote, and we saw that they were that this was a frustration not just for them, but amongst political um, get out the vote organizations who who were dismayed that young people hadn't registered in the numbers or didn't show up at the polls in a way that um, would make a difference to youth voter issues, and so we thought if you could get a high school kid to say to an older brother in college or to a neighbor who might be um, uh, not not going to go to vote, I can't vote. I can't vote. But please, will you do it for me? Will you be my proxy? And so um, we developed a platform and a website and we got captains in 30 states or so. Uh, all get, you know, rallying young people to get just one person to the polls. And after the election, I think we had some success in doing that. Uh, we we passed the platform off to a system of uh, called democracy prep public schools, and they have schools, they have um, civics education programs in, I don't know, 15 or 20 states. Nevada is one of them. Uh, New York is another. And so they think that this is a very good tool to educate uh, young people in being good participants in democracy. It's a civics exercise. So every election now, they get their students to find a proxy and get that one person to the polls. Very, very cool. That's such a worthwhile yeah. endeavor. So of course, you know, because we're talking about the Gilded Mountain, we should probably get back to it a little bit. Uh, well. <laughs> I do hope that book clubs will find their way to this book. I think it would be a fantastic book to discuss, being a former book club leader myself. Um, Gilded Mountain will be in bookstores and libraries on November 1st. Uh, librarians love to help empower people to get registered to vote. So if you need help, stop into your local library and they'll get you the information you need. 
So thank you so much for joining us today, Kate, on the first 50 pages. It has really been a pleasure. And I, I, I could sit and chat with you for hours, I think, about all of this. It's fascinating to me, um, your work and your partnerships and your experience. But um, thank you for giving us your time today to talk about Gilded Mountain. Oh, Jen and Kelsey, it's been my absolute pleasure. It's such a rare thing to um, get to talk to people who are so engaged with literature and community. And I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, Kate. You too, both of you. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. you.